Hello, everybody. This is the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Today is Wednesday, May 25th, 2022. Um, I'd like to welcome all uh, the members here today on this beautiful sunny day. Um, just recognize them. We have Zach Bell, uh, Mark McLean, Rob Henderson, Trish Altez, and Carla Bernard. And uh, my name is Gordon McNeely, and I'm the chair. Um, so just start right off the bat, can we get a motion to adopt the agenda? Uh, Carla Bernard. And uh, we'll move right into our presentation. And just a quick reminder to uh, our members that the, um, the, the, the Hansard switchover is being done in the booth. So um, we'll just try to keep the conversation kind of talking to a minimum. I'll, uh, I'll uh, recognize you and then we'll just give them a second to, uh, to get their, their uh, things in order. So um, today we're gonna receive a briefing on upstream mental health initiatives from the Atlantic Summer Institute for healthy and safe community. So um, I'll pass it over to our guests so they can introduce themselves for Hansard. Um, you can go on with your presentation. And then after that, I mean, we might wait till the end. If there's some clarification questions, just let me know as we get going and we'll have a, a nice morning, uh, an important presentation. Over Thank to our examples. Yes. Okay, I'd like to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Patsy Beatty Huggin and I'm the coordinator of the Atlantic Summer Institute and have been since it was conceived over a glass of wine many years ago, 2003. So I'll... And I'm Susan Hartley. I'm on the board of directors for ASI. And um, we would like to thank you very much for having us here today. Um, we have spoken with each one of you, your caucuses in the past, in the recent past. Um, and this is really an opportunity to up date uh, where we are and dig deeper into some of the concepts in the brief. Um, so thank you very much for having us here today. Um, also thank you uh, to the opposition for presenting motion 83 in the House and for all of you for unanimously um, passing that motion. So um, one thing, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about who we are, who was involved in developing the brief why we developed the brief, what we feel will lead to transformative change in our health system, and um, dig into those concepts that are core to the policy that sometimes are not so easily uh, understood so that we're all talking about the same thing as we use the language. And then, of course, we'll welcome discussion and uh, questions following that. So um, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Patsy. Okay. Right, so I'll just introduce the Atlantic Summer Institute. Um, just in case you're not familiar with it, I know some people are. They've attended in the summer. And so we are an organization that's a nonprofit organization established in 2003. And then in PEI, um, it, the events themselves have always been in PEI, although there have been projects that have been funded in Atlantic Canada and held outside of PEI. The organization saw itself and still does. Its mission is to serve as a catalyst for social change. And in doing so, to really focus on determinants of health and with the result of, hopefully, the result is creating more inclusive and sustainable communities in Atlantic Canada. So it has an Atlantic Canadian focus, although it is incorporated here in PEI. So uh, it's managed by a regional board of directors. So there is someone from each province, also by a number of people that represent diverse communities. So we have someone from the African Canadian community who lives in Nova Scotia. We also have uh, Inuit uh, representative, uh, First Nations out of New Brunswick. So, um, and also youth uh, reps on our, our board. So again, because of the populations we serve, trying to have the board be representative of those populations. In 2015, actually 2014, but it, it was offered in 2015, uh, we were approached by the Canadian Mental Health Association in Nova Scotia, who had funding for a program called Socially and Emotionally Aware Kids. And it was looking at how, at the point of wanting to, to share some of their research and needing a knowledge translation partner. And they approached us to see if we would, in 2015, offer our program and have it focused on mental health pro promotion for children and youth. So since 2015, um, it was very much a success. In fact, it was oversubscribed. 
hottest summer of the year. We were at Holland College. It had to spill over into two lecture theaters and no air conditioning at that point. There was a, you know, there just wasn't there. So it was quite the experience. But it was such so successful that the Child Advocacy Office in New Brunswick approached their board and asked if we would continue and make a commitment to the programming focused on child and youth mental health promotion for the next three years. So they really felt strongly that one year was not going to bring about change. We really had to focus on it, um, work on developing capacity, sharing research out of the region, in the region, and moving to action. And it would take time to do that. So the board decided, yes, they would. Uh, it seemed to be a big need. And we, our board ex actually expanded as a result of that focus. And we learned a lot about mental health promotion, that it really takes uh, an intersectoral approach, um, that it's a whole of society, multi-stakeholder type of approach. It does not just government's responsibility, that we need to work with communities, with private sector, with um, general public to have their support and a whole of community because a lot of community groups are doing a lot of work but really need that investment in community and in have government engaging with community. So having said all that, in 2017 the program focused on a call to action. Um, ASI had really fulfilled its commitment to the three years focused on mental health promotion and felt we would pivot to a call to action that would then put it out into a wider sphere and more broad ownership for action. So that, uh, that actual call to action was focused on shift in policies, programs, resources, and funding. Having said all that, the next year we went back and revisited it, and then it seems that there are a number of people who come to the an annual policy forum that we host in August, sometimes at UPEI, sometimes at Holland College. And there are enough people that keep revisiting it. There are new people that come in, but new uh, repeats that there's a momentum building to take some action. Now, we've been talking about it long enough. People come together in the summer. They're all committed to it. They meant as a pandemic was moving along, it became more and more urgent that we needed to do something. So in 2020, uh, we had moved to an, a virtual event due to the travel restrictions. And in doing that, um, there was an opportunity to actually reach a lot more people than we realized. We thought that it would limit the interaction, but actually it increased it. And in the closing, the question was put forward to this group, how many of you would be interested in working on a policy brief? We were pretty amazed at the number of people that said they would. And so we, it moved forward then to an organization called Away Home Canada. And who was really focused on reducing um, youth homelessness and taking the lead on this. They had done work on policy development before, and we had over 35 people in the end be involved, but we had 20 people start with a crowdsourcing approach to uh, developing a policy brief on investing upstream, and we'll define some of those, those that terminology, but investing upstream in mental health promotion. So that's really the background to it and how we got to where we are today. So I'll turn it over to Susan. So as Pat oh, so why did we do this? Why did all of these people come together and want, think that we needed this policy brief? And in the way that it's designed, a whole of community, whole of government, whole of society, because we believe that the raising healthy children is the responsibility of all Canadians, and I don't imagine anyone would disagree with that. Um, and that we feel that supporting and promoting infant, child, and youth mental health is central to enabling them to have become lifelong positive contributors. So this isn't, well, the title is infant, child, and youth. This isn't about just infants, children, and youth, because they all grow up to be adults and contributors to society. And also, um, we felt in this policy brief that it was important to focus on how do we strengthen policies and programs that support positive mental health for children and youth, and that that is vital to in creating an inclusive and equitable Atlantic Canada with sustainable health programs and initiatives. As Patsy said, core to this whole brief is the concept of upstream, and I know the word upstream goes around a lot, so we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, 
you know, it, it aims to look at the structural and institutional and attitudinal bases for how we develop programs and how we consider what health is. And it, it brings into play social determinants of health, things that we all talk about all the time. So the focus is to um, equitably improve the mental health of the entire population. This is a population-based uh, concept. Um, and I'll dig into that a little bit deeper. And if you, you've all got one of these, this came out of ASI 2017. And when you unfold this, kind of like one of those old things we had as kids to play with and tell fortunes, um, it talks about all the different contributors to positive mental health uh, in, that, in that kind of whole of government, whole of society way. I'm a psychologist by profession, and I have to tell you, over my more than 30 years of treating people, I would say the vast majority of people did not to see, need to see a psychologist. They needed housing, <laughs> they needed income, they needed a lack of violence in their lives, uh, they needed to have a childhood that was free from trauma. So when we talk about upstream, we're talking about those root causes. And I want to tell a story about this young person who is contemplating jumping off the Hillsborough Bridge. So when we think about that person, we think about what do we do for that person? And we can go back in their history and look at the social determinants of health or the upstream contributors to them ending up on the Hillsborough Bridge. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about those things. We're talking about poverty, racial and ethnic discrimination, family violence, disabilities perhaps, gender perhaps, gender identity, um, displacement, refugees, immigration, um, and those communities, and other things uh, that we consider the social determinants of health. That's what we mean by upstream. It might be the environment in which they live, whether that be the community environment or the home environment or the school environment. It might be, and, and I know when, when this motion was brought forward, there's a discussion about ACEs. It might be the, the violence and trauma that happens in a child's life that it affects their brain development and makes it difficult for them to learn or socialize in the school. When we talk about midstream, that young person on, on the bridge we, you know, we may pull him or her or them out of the stream, mid, midstream, and say, call a helpline, you know, uh, join a youth group, because they're a, ch they're a person at risk. Midstream is those programs and those initiatives that um, are preventative and maybe mitigate the risk, but they don't, they're not promoting wellness and well-being and health they're grabbing those, those people out of the stream before they get to downstream, which are our acute treatment initiatives. You know, our Hillsborough Hospital, our psychiatrists are, are um, maybe if they, if they are, um, they do jump off the bridge and they do, their life is taken, maybe it's um, services to their family or the people grieving them. Those are downstream things. What upstream does and what our policy does is transform the whole idea that we can reduce the number of people that need midstream or downstream, reduce the number of people that end up in the Hillsborough Hospital um, Bridge. So it's all about identifying those root causes and those risk factors that are social patterns and structures, and I'd add attitudes, and having protective factors built into our community, in our policies, in our legislation, in our structures. So the, the goal of the brief is to enhance intersectoral action amongst governments, government departments, private sector, civil society to advance those kinds of upstream investments. Um, and Patsy will talk later about health and all policy and how this, this relates to what we're talking about here. And we want policies that promote equity and mental health about um, for all infant children and youth in Atlantic Canada. So that's our goal. So to achieve, uh, to achieve the goal, um, and those of you who have had a chance to look either at the full brief or in the infographic that we had um, circulated, you know that we've 
chosen four major action areas as priorities. And the first one that relates to government in particular is mental health in all policies, which we have chosen as our policy framework. Uh, there could have been many options. We could have created a new one. But in our research, we found that the work that's happening on mental health in all policies is a global effort to really make um, governments take a look at the way in which policy is developed. So we're really looking at some transformative ways that people are developing policy because this will mean that all sectors and governments, government departments are responsible for building policy that fosters well-being and mental health equity. So it's an approach, and it's not just something that you say, oh, well, we'll, we'll do it, and we'll do it, and we'll do it. It's systematically established by a government to, um, and in places where there are examples, they've really had a secretariat, a, an actual part of their organization that begins to take a look at policies that exist in governments. So they consider the health and social implication the policies that are being contemplated before they're acted, before they're legislated by all sectors of government. And it really is a critical policy lever because when you look at the kinds of root causes that we were just talking about, many of those drivers of health outcomes really are beyond the reach of the health sector. So we always talk about trying to look at health system change and health reform, but if we were to make the change further upstream in terms of the way policies are developed, the health system could be looking at more of the work on reorganizing, focusing on those midstream and downstream efforts, and the total re approach could be on investing in the upstream. Um, with that, I think that's what I was really trying to say here with distinguishing between just saying health and mental health are being embedded in all policies to really say that all policies have an effect on health. So there's not a single department that doesn't have an impact on the health of the population. That is the current system where this is an example from the policy brief and actually this comes from a group in Nova Scotia who was doing work, uh, it's called Raising the Villages and they're working in communities to try to make a shift at the municipal level in the way that policy is developed. So this is not just governments at the provincial level, this is really looking at governing bodies and governance generally is at the municipal level how is policy developed also because municipalities actually have more opportunity to touch and reach citizens in some ways than the provincial governments do. But with this one, it really uh, set it aside so you could see where the economic development, business development, family resource were all taking action on the same citizens, They're probably the same people visiting their departments at different times. Um, but nothing that was really coordinated, they weren't necessarily talking to each other. And it doesn't mean, and the more I'm reading about health and all policies, it doesn't mean that there isn't merit to having siloed systems deliver services, but the policies that guide them are the ones that need to be more integrated. Um, and I'll just talk for just a second. This, if this is what it could look like, it's more upstream coherence where there is that policy, that secretariat, or that piece of the of government that actually takes a look at all policies before they get moved to the legislature for approval. And um, you can see that Raising the Villages is looking at municipalities and local communities because that is where their impact is. This is a nonprofit organization in Cape Breton, actually, that has taken this upon themselves to get this moving. Uh, and they are signed on as a partner to our work in Atlantic Canada and have a lot of tools that we can be using. One of the things I just wanted to mention before I move on from that is that uh, many of you are familiar with the Circle of Health, which is also a way of rethinking, making, having a difference in the way people think about health as being mental health is really a big part of the center of the circle, and it really is drawn from the Aboriginal uh, medicine wheel. So that becoming more familiar with Indigenous ways of knowing is really helpful to all of us. And this is a way of actually integrating all that based on our values. The blue ring is all about the determinants of health, that this is, this is where we're all aiming, all departments, regardless of which, whether it's employment, whether it's education, whatever uh, resource you have, 
in the end, this is where we're going. And we're working with families, individuals, uh, systems, communities, and society uh, with many different strategies to get there. So this is a helpful planning tool. I'm doing a lot of work with it right now. Um, and having conversations with um, health promotion folks, Department of Health, as to how we can bring it back to PEI. It was developed here. It's gone all over the world. and. Coming back again, I think, has, uh, probably was ahead of itself at the time. So it's just a way of thinking. Sorry, were you done? What? Are you done? Sorry. Sure. <laughs> I can be done. I can keep talking. <laughs> Go right ahead. I jumped ahead. You OK? Yes, go ahead. Um, so Patsy's mentioned the first action area, which is develop, uh, using a health and all policies framework. Um, the second action area is the whole of society, and this requires a multi-stakeholder platform. And what we mean by that is bringing together um, private sector, civil society, communities into the conversation about child and youth mental health. And you know, one, one example of that might be an interagency council that brings together all the different sectors of the of civil society and um, the public sector, um, and and there are organizations and provinces that have multi-stakeholder platforms already, um, and the the government has led on some of those as well. So the idea is that a multi-stakeholder action recognizes that the social and economic factors influencing health exist outside of the health sector, as Patsy said. Um, every Government department um, is is relevant to this. I, I'd like you to think about where we find children, and we find children everywhere, and therefore um, the health of the population needs to exist everywhere. Um, and it's easy to see where it might be in education or social development or justice, but a little bit harder to see agriculture or infrastructure, but it certainly does. Um, when we th when we pave roads, we need to think about the traveling and the transportation of children and how children get to school and so on, right? Um, and the the third area, uh, investment area, is the whole of community, and that is investment in community actions. So there's lots of community groups and organizations, as we know, especially on PEI, but all over Atlantic Canada, already doing the work to s create supportive environments for children and youth. And so ensuring and where, where the government comes or legislation comes into um, action here is supporting that work, and that's vital. Uh, one of the ways to support it, Patsy's going to talk about, which is the, the last priority area, is funding. Right. So one of the problems you probably heard from your constituents and from different community groups is that they receive their funding through applying for projects. And they have a certain mission starting off. And if they don't, if they run short of money and they see a funding opportunity, they might get into mission drift to go after the money just to keep the organization alive. Um, what we found through the pandemic and in work I've done in other places as well, is some of these community groups are the ones that are actually in contact with people in the communities. They're the ones that are supporting on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, an example in Nova Scotia, a project was with the um, whole digital component when everything moved online, and there were communities who were disadvantaged, or people who were disadvantaged, and those community groups were the ones who were reaching out and trying to help them get access to the internet. Um, but they didn't have, the community groups themselves did not have the money, and actually doing this work was not in their mandate. But there was no flow of resources to them. And some of those organizations really felt like their budgets were all dwindled and they might not survive through the pandemic. So there was, um, having taken that as an example, the idea is that we, we need to develop some form of sustained and integrated funding that is moving people toward those markers that this is important to everyone. So organizations that are doing this kind of work need to know that um, there is a cross-sector child and youth mental health fund, that there is 
multi-year funding, that they're not going to have to go looking again next year to, to see whether they can stay alive or not, because they can't really develop their programs in the way that they can. And in doing that, make sure that we have a rigorous approach to innovation, that we don't just aren't delivering the same program year after year without evaluating it and having to meet certain standards in terms of declaring outcomes or achieving some of those outcomes. So there has to be some thought around it. It's not just passing out money willy-nilly because you want to do it, but really having everyone know that they're moving in the province to the same ends and that there's some accountability factor to it. So our recommendations and our outcomes are actually, they're in very small font for a reason. But you have it, right? Yes. <laughs> Everybody has uh, those on the flip side. It's a two-sided uh, infographic. So all the recommendations are there. Um, one of the things to think about, a lot of those recommendations are for government action, but there are recommendations also for civil society to take a look at their own policies and for government, for private sector to take a look at their policies. So we have a lot of work to do in mobilizing this brief, not just with governments, but also getting out to the public sector so they understand that resources may need to be reallocated. We're not looking at new dollars necessarily. We're looking at investment upstream as being really important and that that's going to make a difference. And people need to understand that because otherwise you're always having the knock at the door in terms of crisis and the expectation is there. So we see some of our work in working with you folks, but also doing some work ourselves to try to uh, look for public support. Uh, I think the other thing just to say is that um, there, we have been working with Indigenous communities in developing this brief and know that they're really needing to work more in partnership with provincial governments and with municipalities for support for Indigenous-led initiatives as well. That we're not trying to direct what they do, but rather to hear their voice and let that voice be, be heard. So um, those are some of the recommendations that we have of the full brief we put the links there. Um, Samantha also has the links. I think they went out so you can get a chance to look at all of it in more detail. And um, I think my last point, and then I'm turning it over to, uh, to Susan, is that all of this has been built on evidence. And if you look at our reference section of our brief, you can get a sense that it's built on evidence on brain science. It's also built on evidence related to community resilience and on work on policy. So I'll pass it over to you. You're very generous for time, and I think probably we've gone beyond what we were asked, but that's, we just, we just have a little bit more. Um, I put up here motion 83 just to remind you all what you um, passed. Um, because the, the two resolutions coming from motion 83 um, were, for urging the government to undertake fundamental change in the way it builds healthy public policy and as opposed to public health policy. And it's really important to think about that because as Patsy said, it's all of the departments of government that, that we're talking about. Um, and to urge government to implement what you're hearing today in terms of the policy brief. So that's just a, just a reminder and how grateful we are that this came to the floor and that you all unanimously passed it. So next step, these are some of our next steps. Um, we have requested to meet with premiers. We would like um, this to go to the Council of Atlantic Premiers. We think this is a regional initiative. You know, it's, it's, we're certainly working on PEI specifically, but we're also an Atlantic organization and the Atlantic provinces have been working really strongly together on our board. Um, we will be informing leaders in, as Patsy said, not just in government, but in communities, in municipal governments, in private sector and the public, and the public sector to seek their support for this. And we'll continue to work collaboratively to take action. Thank you, Susan. So having completed our presentation, um, we just wanted to let you know that we are working right now on three fronts. We are hosting the uh, Summer Policy Forum this summer and bringing in speakers uh, who are doing work in health and all policies, going to have workshops on how do you implement health and all policies. Um, and also there's a speaker from the um, 
National Collaborating Center on Healthy Public Policies who's been doing a national scan of how other provinces, what's going on across the country in terms of implementing health and all policies, and she will be presenting on that. So it's a good opportunity uh, to actually be in touch and have some conversations with others in Atlantic Canada in terms of the forum. We also have two projects that we were very fortunate in, uh, for which we were very fortunate to receive funding. Um, one is with the PEI Alliance on Mental Well-Being, um, and that will position PEI as a three-year project and will position PEI really as a pilot in all of this. So there's some investment for us to work on the first year around knowledge mobilization and the second and third year more on implementation and capacity building for the mental health and all policies piece. Um, there's an evaluation that will go along with that and an application into social sciences research, hoping that that comes through, we'll know this month, uh, to develop a case study on what's happening on PEI and the difficulties, the challenges, the good, the bad, you know, the kinds of things that you run into. The other project which is being announced tomorrow um, is funding from the federal government, Public Health Agency of Canada Intersectoral Action Fund, is actually, um, we were one of the lucky recipients. I think there were over 700 applications that went in, and uh, Summer Institute was fortunate to get funding for a one-year project for Atlantic. So this is where the PEI one is specific to PEI. This is going to be an Atlantic project. And it should, with that funding uh, and the funding from PEI, we should really have a very interesting project and mobilization in Atlantic Canada to see how this can roll out. So there's an announcement tomorrow, and all of you are invited. If you haven't received an invitation already, you'd be sure to get an invitation. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for your presentation. And uh, I guess I'll open it up to uh, the floor. Uh, start with Carla Bernard. Uh, Thank you so much for that presentation. And I have to tell you, you know, we've been, I've been sitting in this seat now for three years. And when I got into it, it was about, for me, the mental health of children and youth and recognizing the lifelong impacts of not having a healthy childhood. So in a place where we may not see a whole lot of movement and the more we learn, the more daunting a job it feels in government. So an organization like ASI gives me great hope. You know, we've, you've done the work. It's just up to government to implement these things. And that is where things get stuck. And so um, as I consider this, as, you know, we consider what's going on in the world right now with, with our children south of the border. And it's a mm. very emotional time as, as we consider children. So this mm. today to me feels extra you know, a good day to, to be talking about this, while, while, albeit a little emotional. I'm wondering, so we passed Motion 83, and it's amazing. And one of the things that I've often said as much, like what you said today, if we invested in our children and youth and their mental health right now, yep, it's going to cost a lot of money. You're darn right it is. And yet, we're still gonna have to put out fires. As these children go, we're still gonna have to put out fires with, with adults who didn't have that upstream approach. But once these children got to adults, the cost savings, the resource savings, our systems would just change and transform naturally if we started here. And so I 100% see the value in that. I, I see that, and I, I, I don't know why we aren't there, to be honest. So I'm wondering, with this Motion 83, what does that look like practically for you? What would we see different in our systems and services if we saw a government who was committed to this and investing in this? What would that look like? Well, I, th I think it comes under the health and all policies framework and that, that there would, and the platform, that there would be dedicated funds to position or an office or or something in the in the public sector um, overseeing it, it's sort of I think there's a is is there there's a position on climate that somebody who has that lens or the gender lens it would be that idea to as Patsy showed in her diagram that there would be um, the policy part of, of governance would be going through a single 
health and all policies framework. So how how is this how is the decision from your transportation and infrastructure affecting children's lives in a positive way and what are the unintended negative consequences? Somebody who has that. So that in a very practical way, and there are models for this. Um, New Brunswick brought in something, Quebec. Quebec, has Quebec been for was years. forefront on it. Um, Newfoundland did. I know Manitoba did for a while. I believe with the change of government they might have lost that. I'm not sure. Um, so on a practical level, it would be the dedication to funds for, for that role. The other part of it, and Patsy, you can speak to, is in order for us to follow through on, on the work that we're doing, we really need to partner. And we really need um, sort of the doors open into the, the knowledge mobilization and the training of people in the public sector so that when they are developing programs, when they are assessing and evaluating programs, and they're doing all those things, they have that upstream lens, um, and they also have that health and all policies lens. So, um, mm. Patsy? Well, what, we have, what we're looking at right now is A, having conversations, because the more you have conversations, the more people are aware of the evidence that's behind it, the more they start to think differently and have a conversation with the person beside them. So it's part of it is that shift in the culture to understanding that health is about balance. If we go to the way that an indigenous worldview would be, that we have balance in all of the aspects of our health and that our mental health and our physical health need to be in balance. It's not one or the other. We really need to think about that. And a conference I was just at last week was, was international really saying that we are doing a disservice by not having the spiritual element included in our discussion of health. So I think that really uh, if we look at the circle of health or look at the medicine wheel, all those are there. So it's about that culture shift to understanding that what, what it means to be healthy is mental health is a huge part of that. So we just need to keep open that dialogue as a, a soft way of, of moving this along. And that's why for the first year of what we're taking on in the Atlantic area is to open up the conversations. The next is who is doing it, where are the skills, where, who is already making marks ahead. We discovered last week that there's been a global working group who's been developing uh, uh, strategies for mental health promotion globally um, and now have that report. I just sent it on to Susan the other day. So I hadn't seen that before, but one of the, there's about seven different strategies. Some relate to schools, some relate to communities, but the one that we're right on the cusp of, which didn't even know because we hadn't seen it before, is mental health in all policies. So what we do is going to be contributing to some global knowledge as well as to our own knowledge. Not to say that's why we're doing it, just to be out there front, but if we said we know how to do it exactly, that there's a definite road map, would be to say that's not true. Everybody is trying to make that shift. We know there are sectors where it's worked well, and we can draw on that evidence and that expertise. So the second year went on PEI, because we have some funding for PEI to do this, is about the capacity development. And that's what uh, Susan was referring to, is we want to work with HR departments in government, in uh, municipalities, and in private sector to really take a look at how policies developed and rolled out and do they, how could they take on this health and all policies and this broader view of health in the way that employees are treated because employees are future parents or are parents already. They have an impact on kids. You know, how do we get that, that started and build that capacity? The, uh, I found out, again, through conversations and because of our partners, we have a lot of national partners also. So the National Collaborating Center on Social Healthy Public Policy is actually developing training right now on intersectoral action and health and all policies. And they see this as an opportunity. They might be able to pilot their the work that they've already done here on PEI if we have the opportunity. So it's not like we are coming into it with no resources. We don't have maybe, you know, we need to partner in order to have access to the expertise. But if the climate's right and the doors are open, we feel like we can help out and we can bring forward that expertise. And we're in a unique position right now because of the funding opportunities. If, if I can add something on, on maybe a, a less 
grand scale, you have already um, initiatives like midwifery um, or like I know social emotional learning has been talked about. And, and midwifery is a great example. If you look <coughs> at midwifery and you and you apply a health and all policies upstream um, framework on midwifery, uh, midwif midwives are qualified to look after psychosocial, physical, community. If, if they were fully regulated, they would be a wonderful example of upstream initiative to meet a child before they're, they're born, <laughs> maybe even before they're conceived, and identify what they need in the way of prevention and promotion. Um, to, so you already have initiatives and things on the book. Now, Patsy's diagram about you don't want midwifery doing something and somebody else doing something, somebody else. You want it going through the lens of how does this get our children where we want them to get in life. Mm -hmm. um, but you do, you already have. I'm thinking also, I mean, as you would know, Trish, social and emotional learning, how much effort has been placed on social emotional learning and piloting the PATHS project. We've got two schools that have actually been testing and piloting a good evidence-based project. And if you talk to people in those schools, they're saying, why aren't we doing that in other schools on PEI? And I'm not sure why. But I mean, one of my things, before we actually moved in this direction, we were focused, there was one of my legacies is going to be evidence-based social and emotional learning programs in the schools. Because that's really, you know, it may not be the perinatal at birth, but if you had that in early childhood programs and you have that in the schools, then it's a way that you can really help the kids develop protective factors, regardless of where their home environments are. They have skills that they can navigate life. And the, the evidence is huge in terms of what the, you know, at 24, what those kids are able to do. They have employment, they have more stable relationships, it's all kinds of things. So. I think you're right. Um, we do have programs that have been initiated here. They just get piloted, they get started, and then somehow the teeth's not there to keep it keep it going. Mm -hmm. Carla? Oh my God, you're so speaking my language right now. I have so much to say. I don't even know where to go, so I'm just going to try my hardest. Focus on what you just said. Um, a couple of things there. So, so when you said a focus on um, social emotional learning in schools, of course, with my background, I noticed a change in how we were delivering education and a shift away from play-based learning. And it bothered me at the time, a lot, but there was not, I mean, there was lots of research about it, but it was kind of not until more recently that people understood play-based learning is really important because it helps them. Um, that you, is the opportunity to introduce social emotional learning and that it's a natural way for them to learn. And I just read an article last night, once again, about um, the shift, this push to put our kids, to make sure our kids are doing well academically, they're not okay any other way, you know? And so how are we measuring success? So I'm gonna get to a question on measurements, but I'm gonna take the long route, the long way to get there. Um, so you were talking about your project, which I think is super exciting. I'm so happy you got that funding to work with HR departments. I think that that's such an interesting route and I'd love to hear more about your project as a sidebar. Um, and talking about how policies is delivered, developed and rolled out. One of the things that I learned, and when you talk about having a person or, or somebody who's um, kind of overseeing this, uh, or a department, I can't remember exactly what you said, but what I'm hearing how important it is, is to have someone who is a, a big picture thinker, someone who can see the connections between things, because we all don't have that skill. And that's a crucial skill for this, because then we would see how, why, midwifery, Thousand First Days Initiative, Women and Gender Diverse Islanders, the very things that we, that the government is having trouble getting rolled out are the very things that we're talking about here that are upstream. And so we've got a lot of pushing to do for the big picture, so that we get people looking at the big picture. We consider transportation in there, sidewalks, and why those matter to kids. Like this is, this stuff matters. Another example of that, and why I'm happy to hear you will be working with HR departments, is something I recently learned about accessibility supports through social development and housing. Accessibility supports now has grown their umbrella to include uh, mental health supports, but they do not include in their list of services counseling and therapy services. Two of the most important things that we know help children and youth. And trying to push government to see that 
issue, big picture thinkers are really important here. So all that to say, um, when, as we consider the implementation of, of such a policy, which feels funny calling it a policy, because this is, to me, transformational change. This is, this is where it's at. But what sort of things, how would we know, let's put ourselves a few years down the road, and we've had full cooperation, and everyone's seeing the big picture, and they get it. I'm wondering what success looks like. What would we be measuring, and how would, what, would, what would our success look like? What would we be measuring? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you go, you can have that. Uh, <laughs> well, there's, there's, I mean, there's certainly quantitative and qualitative um, outcomes. And I mean, the quantitative is, and, and timelines, I'm not sure. But a reduction in people who need safe injection sites, <laughs> a reduction in, in hospital visits for mental health. I mean, you know, we know primary physicians are, are inundated with mental health concerns and, and so a reduction in that, a, re a reduction in the number of children coming. I, I had the opportunity to teach an education class on social emotional learning for, for people who are going to be teachers in, in high school and we identified that you can have a class of 20 children who are, you know, so discrepant in their attachment, you know, health, their emotional health, their social health, and their cognitive health. It's what you, it's what you said, right? And, and so it would be, the qualitative stuff is you would be hearing from educators, you would be hearing from early childhood educators that, that they are seeing healthier students, um, emotionally health, social, and, and even cognitively, because we know the brain development stuff affects cognition. So you'd, you'd see that, you would, um, so all of those sorts of things, Carly, it's what you said, it's a, it's a front end load of a lot of money. We still have to do the acute stuff, absolutely, but the demand for that. We wouldn't be talking about we don't have enough psychiatrists, we'd be talking about how do we fund community, um, supports for new mothers, or how do we, you know, those sorts of things. And, and again, the cost saving and the number of people you could employ to do that versus one psychiatrist would be some of your outcomes. Um, so, so, is that you? It's me. I thought it was turned on. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think it's a really good conversation to have. Um, I was going to go back here because we do have, on, on the thing we gave you, there are some, some outcomes of just the implementation of this policy brief, which doesn't end up with the outcomes you're talking about, but by doing increased collaboration, you would have long-term relationships with community organizations for people. It wouldn't be year to year, right? So if things like that, and I'm all over the place, but. <laughs> um, I, I'll pick it up from there. What we're using is um, just, we're meeting with the evaluator uh, last week um, and taking a collective impact approach. So if we have the same vision of what we want for the province and the same general qualities that we want, then you would identify those impacts. And these ones are more general, but the kinds that um, Susan are talking about, we can work on together. So I think it's taking that collective impact approach. We're starting with the steering committee that's going to be Atlantic Canadian. But we also are starting on the PEI project, which is focused more on PEI. So it gives that opportunity to pull people together as an advisory committee and working with people here to say, what are some of the measurables? What, would, what could we do in one year, two years, three years? So you know, for us, at the end of one year in Atlantic Canada, what we're saying is we'd like to see policies progressing. You know, it can't, it's not, maybe not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. This is a big change that we're looking at for the region. So yeah. how do we make the progress on um, just to see that change starting to happen? And then in, by year two, how are we actually investing now in training people, building that capacity? Mm -hmm. So some of the measures in terms of population measures may be longer term than what we'd like to see. But we have to see that people are engaging in that change first. Um, and then we'll start to see the difference going down the road. And we might surprise ourselves. It might start to happen more quickly than we think. Um, maybe, Carla, one more, because it's just the, the questions and answers. Maybe we'll try to cut that down, just maybe stay focused on uh, 
because I don't know how much time we have, but uh, Carla? <clears throat> just this is my last question oh, for sure. right now. Um, I'm just listening to you speak, and I know you had mentioned the social determinants of health, and I'm thinking about poverty um, so and all that entails. And so um, going down to the community fridge the other night, as I often do, I often see a mom and in this particular case, a mom and three young children sitting in the parking lot with a bag waiting for food. And I started to think to myself, here's a mom who knows what her kids need. Here's a mom who knows that her kids need to play and they need to rest and they need to eat and they need all those things, but this mom can't do those things. And I'm looking at these children sitting in the parking lot thinking, what is this alone <clears throat> going to do to them when they're adults? And so I'm wondering how you see, what, what does your work involve when it comes to things like poverty? Because we know that poverty is a huge barrier. If you can't eat, if you don't have a place to live, how do you expect to, have, how, to be healthy, whether it be mentally, physically, any of those things? So what, how, what do you, how do you see your role there? Because poverty is a poverty, uh, sorry, poverty is a policy choice. We know that. So what, how do you see your work there? Can I answer this? You go right ahead. Yeah. So we, we know that poverty is the single strongest predictor of mental illness. We know that. So great question. Um, I, I sit here and I think, how do we open, I, I mentioned the door, how do we open the door to access collaboration from our government and from our MLAs to access the HR departments, to access the people. So what I see right now, Carla, is not a solid door. It's a window. It's glass. Because you've got, a, as I said, you've got a lot of things. You have all agreed on implementing basic income guarantee. That is an upstream initiative. <laughs> and that will, is part of the eliminating poverty. So that's the simple answer, is we have these. We have this glass door. We see them all there. We don't have access to them. We don't even know if we have motions. I know motions don't necessarily mean commitment to do it. Um, but it's a step. And now, because we have, I joined ASI because of the expertise on ASI. And, and that list of contributors to this brief are national and international experts. To partner with ASI on this, for government to do that, is to open those glass doors. And you have so many of the tools. Acting on basic income guarantee, you know, evaluate it. My guess is worldwide that is one, the, the number one step to eliminating poverty, right? And it's upstream. Thank you. Trish? So appreciating this conversation, I mean, just to echo something that Carla just said, you know, poverty is a policy choice, and I think that <laughs> just recognizing that key core truth is is such a huge hurdle to really addressing it. And, uh, and thank you, Susan, for um, you know pointing out the uh, the reality that uh, you know something like a basic income uh, would have a, a huge huge impact on uh, the overall mental health and well-being. Um, of uh, of our societies, right? I mean, I just I wanted to just touch on that again. But uh, the questions I wanted to ask um, were related to social emotional learning in schools, and um, uh, Patsy had had mentioned uh, my name briefly around social emotional learning. So I was one of the senior researchers on the um, socially and emotionally aware kids project, which was a three year um, project um, that the Atlantic Summer Institute was uh, a part of, um, and. Uh, as, as Patsy mentioned, that included uh, the piloting of PATHS, which is a uh, evidence-based uh, program uh, to help children develop social uh, and emotional learning skills. So that was implemented near the end of those three years, actually, in PEI. Um, but uh, what um, that project was not just a PEI project. It was uh, for all of the four Atlantic provinces. Uh, and their, the PATH project was actually piloted in um, Newfoundland and, and New Brunswick, if I recall correctly, as well in schools. And Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia as well, yes, um, uh, for the full three years. So um, you mentioned that the, uh, the, in PEI, it hasn't, PATHs hasn't gone beyond those, those two schools. Um, What's happening in those other provinces, I guess? I only know sort of where it ended in 2018. Well, I've been in touch with Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. So I know what happened there is that 
um, the person who was the in the Department of Education was a real believer in paths, and she had the support of her manager. The other thing that happened is the the year the federal government had um, delivered or said they would uh, send some money for mental health uh, into each of the provinces. Their mental health department, Department of Health, approached her to say, what would it cost to roll out paths in the whole province? Mm. And we fund that through some of this money. So they actually used paths um, and did a cost of what it would take to roll out the curriculum in the whole province for the elementary school. I think it's K to four that paths covers. And that's what they've done. So they now have support for paths from K to four in all, I and mean, she said there was one school they went to in some little community in Newfoundland that only had one teacher and he was the janitor and the principal. And they, they cost it up for that school too. So it was an experience for them to actually see where the kids are. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's happening and they've, so for the kids when they finish grade four, she's taken on, I can't remember which of the evidence-based programs for the next level. But they're, as the kids finish, they're going to be augmenting that with a program that's more targeted for that age group. But I, I can give you her name if you want to talk to her. It's Ellen Cody. You yes, might have met. I you know her. Ellen, absolutely. She, yes. She's amazing, and Fantastic. she was a driving force behind that. Mm. Great. No, that's wonderful to hear. And and uh, my uh, colleague uh, mentioned um, play-based learning, and actually the past program it it uh, it involves play-based learning. So like you get kind of a, the teacher would get a kit, and it has kind of puppets in it, and and it's part of you know like you they go through these sort of exercises. Anyway, it's a fantastic program. Um, and uh, I know that um, it was very successful here in PEI, at least for the, the year that I was evaluating it. Oh, so I've I, been to the school. In yeah, the, yeah, it's, yeah. Hunter River has has that program, and right. uh, you talk to the principal there. She's just all over it. I know it's quite neat. Yes. Yeah. And sorry. <laughs> oh no, not at all. But but the, but these are the types of initiatives, right? That really are are, are think about that. That you know the upstream impact, this, this, is, this is what can happen, right? So, you know, when children are able to develop these skills in social emotional learning, so, you know, things like understanding their own emotions and the emotions of others, working well with other people, um, you know, these are skills that will serve them well in their own mental health, but also, you know, in society in general, in the labor market, in your being a part of your community. So these are our goals that we should all be, you know, striving to, to support children to develop. So I just, I'm so, what I, what I really appreciate about ASI, well, there's several things, but um, about this work toward upstream mental health is this, this hope, right, that we have for the future. So instead of just sort of constantly putting out fires and, and trying to, you know, to help people at the end of, of the stream where they're, they're in crisis, if we can put more investment into the upstream work, then, then I just, I'm so hopeful for what this, what this could mean. My question I do have though, um, so the, the Social Emotion Aware Kids Project was a three year project, as I mentioned, and it was the four Atlantic provinces funded through FAC and um, Community uh, Mental Health Association, I believe in Nova Scotia. Yeah. So that was a, a very substantially, you know, very well funded project that could really do a lot in those three years. So you've got three years of funding, um, if I heard you correctly, from the Alliance of Mental Health and Wellbeing, um, which would be PEI specific. Yes. Um, but a core part of the work you're doing is that regional um, piece, right? So I'm wondering if you could expand a bit on, first of all, the importance of like what of three years of funding, what that means versus sort of that those small projects or a one year project, and 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 what more, you know, I guess the limitations as well of it being, you know, that PEI based for that component mm -hmm. those three years. Well, I, I mean, I'll give you a reality on this is that we are um, a nonprofit that does not have core funding, mm -hmm. so every year we're writing proposals. So this is the work that we wanted to do, and the opportunity was there to apply to Public Health Agency Intersectoral Action Fund. That proposal went in in July last year. Hmm. Like this is now May. Right. Almost June. So you know you can. So did we? Did we know we were going to get that? I mean, we sent out proposals all the time. Didn't know. So, but but thinking, what if we do get that? And then here's the opportunity to apply for the PEI project. If we, if we happen, let's dream that we got both, uh -huh. how could they work together? So that's what we did. So with the PEI project, um, the, there is the maximum amount for three years, which is not enough to really 
do the work that we might want to do, but it certainly is more than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. So the first year, we'll, we'll be able to really maximize this knowledge mobilization piece. And then with PEI, we've positioned it as being that pilot for it moving to the next phase of implementation. Because it's very hard to do that. And as Susan has said, you know, we need to work with you folks to open some doors for us to do it. You can't, it's very hard to do that with every government in, mm -hmm. in Atlantic region. So it was great opportunity and great alignment is how we saw it, is to take PEI. Um, it's smaller. It might really help us to learn a lot and test out some things that we might not have been able to do otherwise. And so uh, that's how it, it all happened, and that's the alignment. And I'm, we're, really, we're really excited about it and hope that we can work with you folks to make it, it really happen. Mm -hmm. and I just want to reiterate, we're not talking about projects or programs. Mm -hmm. We're talking about transformative change in the way we consider something. And my hope after three years is that it will, for everyone making decisions in this province, it will be like you can't stop thinking of a pink elephant if you say pink elephant, right? So I'm hoping what our outcome is that people cannot stop thinking in terms of upstream and in terms of the understanding of why people behave the way they do given brain builder mm -hmm. research, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the goal of this. We're not going, we don't want to fund something for three years. Mm -hmm. We want to change the way people understand things and think about things. And that's why I added attitudinal um, aspects that need shifting as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think, yeah, just to add to that, I think that's why we think it's important that we partner with the PEI um, Alliance, is that you know we don't know where we will be in three years. We know we want to build capacity here for whatever organization. So we want to work with not just the PEI Wellness Coalition or Alliance, sorry, but, but also with other community organizations like United Way, like Boys and Girls. You know, when we're looking at an advisory committee, we're looking at one with broad representation from organizations here and that that capacity is going to last. And we might move on to something else. We don't know yet. I mean, and or where we'll be, but that's the role, and that's, the, that's what the energy is behind, is building capacity and a legacy that will make a difference in the province. Yes, uh, yeah, very exciting. Uh, pink elephant all the way. Let's, yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful way to put it, that it's something that will just be top of mind uh, in, in every, all the work that, that's done here. So it's exciting. Um, I'm wondering a little bit more, uh, if you could tell me a little bit more about the relationship then um, between ASI and the Alliance for Wellbeing, um, uh, other than the, the funding aspect. You mentioned partnership. What, what does that look like? Well, I think we kind of backed off partnership so much. I use that word partnership broadly because we want to collaborate with people. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's better for us to be collaborating than to not, mm -hmm. you know, we're moving forward. And so with any collaboration, we're testing the waters, trying to build a, tr a relationship. They're new to us. It's a new organization. We've been here a while, so we're having conversations right now and trying to see if there are some things that we might be able to work on together that meet both agendas um, and see how that goes. Test the waters, see how it goes. So that's it. Trish? And I just, just one more question. So uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the funding that, that you um, have received, are there, can you tell me a bit, a bit, more, uh, a bit more about how that's, um, if there are reporting requirements, uh, for example, or um, are there any limitations on publications or how that, all those pieces are sort of playing out? Hmm. Do you know what? That's a really good question, and I know it's there in the details, but if you ask me right today to tell you what they are, there are definitely reporting requirements. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think off the top of my head, the reporting requirements for the Alliance on Mental Illness is, is much more regular and stringent than FAC. Yeah. Um, we recognize that FAC has been giving grants for a long, long time, and the Alliance is new to it. So I think there's probably some, I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, but as far as, as publications, I, I don't. I don't know. We'll have, have to look to, at those details. Look, Thank you. As yeah. to whether we can publish yeah. from it. That's, I mean, that's the goal, of course, yeah. would be to be able to. So that was my researcher hat yeah. there. Just to no, know that's, 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 who's got, who's that's a really good question. I did know yeah. about the financial part. Like, so we've got forms already from the Alliance and 
public health agency is really saying keep your books in order. I mean, if you're ever audited, you need to be able to account for it, but we need the evaluation report and mm -hmm. um, you need to speak to it. But there's, it's really given us a lot of, I think they, we have a very detailed proposal anyway. <laughs> Good logic model and all kinds of work plans and output. So uh, I think they just said, you look like you're well prepared, get on with it, and then we'll talk. So. That was for the Alliance for Mental No, no that, that was FACT. Because I think FACT usually, if I remember, it's kind of every year you, they do. You, yeah, yeah, well, their funding okay. is for one year only. So Oh, this in this case, yeah, right. Okay. In this case, it's one year. Gotcha. Okay. So I guess the um, the reporting for the Alliance for Mental Wellbeing, you're sort of that's sort of developing as as things go. Then it sounds. Then like. we have forms. We have you forms. Have forms. Okay. And, the, and there are requir reporting requirements in it. Okay. Can follow up question. Trish, there? Yeah. So did, are they um do they like are they standard forms then? Yes. It looks like that's probably okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of just questions to end with. Have, uh, I know you've consulted with a lot of people. What has your involvement been with the child uh, and youth advocate? Are you, have you met with him? When um, they've been part of the conversations when we presented this, Pat, so you could. You right. Could so when the brief was launched them. on March 9th, they attended, there were staff from their office attended, and they'll be invited to be on the advisory committee for the PEI project. Which else, that will be the next one to get going. Um, we're getting the steering committee yeah. off the ground for the public health agency one on Friday and then the next one will be the, the local one yeah. and they're, they're invited to that. Yeah. But uh, up until now we haven't been having local conversations. We've really been trying to get the, the bigger picture in mind and yeah. get moving. Yeah. Perfect. Because I know that they've been involved in, in this so just streamlining. I think they have an interest for sure yeah. because they wouldn't have come to the briefing if they weren't yeah. interested. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the only thing I was going to to say too is that what do we we're we're trying to summarize and uh, obviously put in um, some recommendations to the legislature. So I want to make sure that because that won't be until end of October, November. So I just want to make sure that you have this opportunity to if there was one or two things that you would want to see in the major major highlights. What would um, I know? We went over a lot of things. What could we boil it down to, to make sure that the group is feeling heard? And and what what is what are those one or two things? Well, one I mean one is is the communication, the opportunity to speak to departments, um, to the Atlantic Council of Premiers. I mean that's a big ask, but that's really where we want to be to have that conversation happen at that level. And then more locally in your departments, I think that's that would be a start. Um, the big one, if it is in terms of a rec those things can happen between before November. So the big one would be to start looking at structural the structures that could be created within government to actually implement the policy recommendations. You know, this policy brief. Like how would you how would you implement it? It's very difficult unless you've got those big big people thinkers who can see all the pieces and have a, a small secretariat that can start reviewing the policies that currently exist and start making some recommendations. So, so I think that's an allocation of funds towards the development of, of that and um, finding the right person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Does the committee feel okay? Um, is everybody? I uh, guess feel okay. That was yeah. uh, that was great, and it was an important uh, day to have that discussion. So, I want to thank you for coming in, Susan and Patsy. Um, you did a great job today. So, what we'll do is we'll just take um, maybe a two minute break, and then come back and we'll let our guests uh, um, exit the the area, and then we'll come back and uh, move on with four, five, and six in our uh, meeting. Short recess.
Okay, so we're moving on to number four, uh, discussion of scheduling. Um, th there's some conflicts for June 1st, so we're not going to have a meeting on June 1st. Um, so that's just one to, to, to keep the uh, committee abreast of that. Um, then our next meeting looks like we're, we're uh, the clerk has done a great job of, of getting letters out and scheduling um, uh, various uh, meetings. So June 15th, the Department of Health said they could, they're available at 1.30 to speak um, to mental health services, Krista Shaw, the Assistant Deputy Minister, um, Mental Wellbeing, and Dr. Javier, Javier Salabaria. I just, I think that's, that's good enough. Um, Provincial Medical Director for Mental Health and Addictions have been designated to present. Uh, would the committee be open to also including um, presentation on long-term care in this meeting? And I might pass it over to the clerk for just a about that. Yeah, so the department's available on June 15th to talk about mental health services, but they've also requested um, that the topic of long-term care be discussed at that meeting as well in a second presentation, um, just because of availability. So I just wanted to check with the committee if that was okay. If not, I can continue scheduling for a secondary meeting on that topic if that's the wish of the committee. Mm. Okay. Carla? Um, how long, those are two massive topics, so I find I, I'm having a hard time wrapping, around my, wrapping my head around having one meeting for that. How long do we figure that meeting would go? It would be at 1.30 in the afternoon, and it could go, we usually set aside two hours for committee meetings, so an hour on each topic, but the meeting can go as long as the committee really is comfortable. Yeah. Um. It is long. Um, do we have, it's just because that would just be with the department. So the department would come in, we would just do that, correct? Like, mm -hmm. so the department, and then after that, the next bullet's on the topic of long-term care, which we could do on a different date. Um, the committee would like to invite, just the clerk was asking which, which groups uh, would the committee like to invite? <clears throat> Private Long-Term Care Association, PI Association for Community Long-Term Care, if there's any others that the committee wants to, to hear or, or, or uh, extend that invitation to. Um, and then you have here too, that may be a different bullet, the unions regarding staff and issues, so that's different. But um, just so that we make sure that everybody's feeling heard about the long-term care and who we're gonna have in. Uh, Carolyn? Um, just back to the initial question, I don't think that we should do long-term care and mental health on the same day. That would be my two cents. Okay, um, so there's one opinion. Anybody else with opinions? Zach? I'll find that in two meetings on the same day. Perfect. I would say the same, uh, maybe we can start earlier than 1.30, maybe 1. That's a good idea. Or, or uh, another option is what about the morning and split yeah. them up that way, uh, just as suggestions. Mm. Mm -hmm. You okay? I'm a sub cord, so. Oh, yes, okay. Perfect. Um, so maybe there's some suggestions there. I think that, do we have to, should we take it to a vote? Do you want to take it to a vote? Uh, Trish? I'm a sub as well, so I don't know. Yeah. Just a quick question though. So this is uh, the, the Department of uh, Health uh, that you are inviting to speak about yeah. mental health and long-term care. It would seem to me, even though it's, it's the department, those are, you would have very different, you would have the minister, but then they would have very different support staff. It just feels like, it just feels like two totally, if they're separate topics, separate big topics. To me, that feels like a lot to take on in one day. Just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Carl? Just a clarification question. Did, were, did they say that the same people would present on those two topics? Or mm -hmm. that just the department it would be the department, and I'm assuming, I only have names for the designated presenters on mental health. I'm assuming they would leave, and then we'd have new presenters on long-term care. Okay. Come in. Thank you. Yeah. So, it, they, that, it, that will be, I think that's a good, if we can start at 1 o'clock, and um, we can always potentially invite them in again or follow up, and um, we can try it. I guess that's what we're... Really Trish? I'm just really curious, like, did there was a rationale provided why it should all be done on one day when we're talking about two different just different staff. I just I don't see the yeah. the reason for it all being done in one day. Did they say why? Uh, they just requested 
that I asked the committee and see if it was possible. Yeah, I just, it seems to me that there would be a lot of questions on oh, both of those topics. You know, I just, in yeah. previous yeah. examples where we've tried to squeeze things, other, this committee, other committees, into one day, um, uh, I know that we've, I, I can say, I've left feeling I haven't been able to ask all the questions that should have been asked. I don't know if others have ever experienced that, but, yeah, yeah mental health and long-term care. Too big. Yeah. Especially, we're still seeing, you know, uh, um, like thinking about long-term care, for example, we're still seeing that uh, the impacts of COVID for long-term care in particular are still quite severe, and we are having islanders who are um, who are dying uh, still of COVID in long-term care. Uh, the difference between private and public, and what that might mean in terms of outcomes, like woof, like there's a whole. There's this. This is so important, um, and mental health. Don't even get me started on that one. That's that's huge. So I I still think I'm gonna, I would advocate strongly that you do this in two different meetings. I can't imagine getting through it in. Yeah. I just can't see it an hour for each. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just checking to, and that's, those are good points. And um, uh, Mr. Mr. Henderson did make a suggestion about the morning. Um, would that be helpful if you went back and asked if we can? So I do know that the minister is not available Wednesday mornings. Okay, so that's a, that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Uh, Zach? Um, thank you, Chair. The only, like I said, I, I do see your points, Trish. You're very bang on there, very big um, things, and maybe the allotted time, but usually the presenters are pretty good to be flexible to add on a little bit, or maybe they're more flexible to go a little bit earlier than the 1 o'clock. I do think that the only problem is, is if, because again, we, we have a, a number of priorities in this committee, the only issue we might run into is the scheduling. If we want this to be something, if this is the time that they're offering to have this meeting now, then we might run into the issue of it being pushed out till September or October. That would be my only suggestion. So again, I am in full agreement that we have the two meetings on the June the 15th, and if we need to ask to extend the time or start earlier, that would be my suggestion. If you say the minister can't be here in the morning, but maybe the committee or the presenters could make their presentation, say at 11 o'clock, and the minister comes, and then we got the minister to ask questions to as the afternoon goes on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another way of yeah. trying to extend it and piece it all together to yeah. accommodate both schedules. But I just I'll throw that out yeah. as, as another suggestion. Yeah. Um, here for one. That, that is a good that's a good suggestion we can maybe bring it back to them I, I think that I mean we're just trying to accommodate obviously the department if we did one third one till two thirty with brief presentations and then two thirty to four that's as best as we could do with time management wise and going um, a little bit longer with the time frame that's given Carol um, just thinking back to the last long-term care meeting and the hard stop time I I I don't think that this is enough time. This could be a four-hour meeting. These are massive topics. I know I, I strongly disagree with it. Um, I know I'm not the only voice on the committee, but I, I do very strongly disagree with this. I don't think that it's going to give it justice if we do this, try to lump it all into one. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's fair. Mm -hmm. And just to add something quick here, I just, this is a, you know, I think rather than seeing this as you know us trying to accommodate the minister quite honestly the minister should be looking at this as an opportunity to share you know what work is being done and to clarify the questions that the public has on these two huge topics so this is this is an opportunity that we are providing the minister to have the space to 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 share the work that they are doing and 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 be able to um to uh, to bring that forward so i think it's we're providing the minister with an opportunity i would hope you would see it that way and uh, and make this time to to for this public engagement on this topic mm -hmm. has it ever been done that the meeting started at 12 noon <laughs> yeah what about if we were to do that start an hour early i mean i'm just um would that be okay if we I mean, I'm just trying to accommodate here to, to question at 12 and some of the, you know, deputies can give information. Then you, I guess my, my only version of all this is that I, I understand how busy they're going to be. I know how meaty these topics are. As a 
committee, we certainly can, if we don't feel we've got enough, we can call them back again. I mean, I, I guess I'm going to take a little bit of something's better than a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> yes, yeah. is my version of it all. Yeah. And uh, who knows how, I mean, I would hope that they won't make it too lengthy of a presentation. I do find previous presentations, that department seems to wear you out with <laughs> how long, long it goes. And then the questions are, you're, you're left feeling that much. So I get, I get what you're trying to say, it's just that I also understand, take what we get and see where it goes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, thank you. Uh, Zach? Thank you, Chair. And sorry, didn't we have, uh, I don't know if it was in this committee or not, but you know we we do try to ask the presenters to limit their presentations to around that 15 minute mark. And even with our previous group there, you know they had mentioned you know the apology they apologized because they were going a little bit longer than what they had thought they had allotted. So again, if we had that 15 to 20 minute presentation, mm -hmm. and going on your suggestion of you know starting earlier and allowing for an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes, up to two hours, you know that's still gives members you know a good hour of questions mm -hmm. yeah thanks and you know um i i just know looking at if if we're looking at the the june calendar we i don't want to lose the opportunity to talk and get get these to the floor both of these topics it's in front of us so i think that if we can look at that day um, clerk, can you go back and do some work with the suggestions, potentially starting at 12, starting at 1, starting at 11, um, and then uh, I think what I'm, what I'm hearing is like, let's have both those in on that day. We'll just try to extend it a little bit more. Trish? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, idea of limiting the presentations is a very good one. Uh, certainly that was uh, an issue in the past. Um, I think as well, uh, you know, it would be my expectation at this point, quite honestly, that the minister take, if, if, if we were to do both of these in one day, that this the afternoon be scheduled for the minister to be doing this work. Um, because when we had the hard stop last time and the minister has to leave for another thing and, and, and uh, there's still so many questions left unanswered, if we are going to accommodate, if this committee is going to accommodate this request, I would say at the very least that they can do, that the minister can do, is to give us whatever time is needed that afternoon mm -hmm. to ask as many questions as possible. There should be no hard stop. That is completely inappropriate. So I would just throw that out there. If, if this is the way that the committee is thinking, okay. there should be no hard stop on that day. Until the committee is ready. Yeah. So we'll let, the, we'll let the clerk correspond. Um, so is that okay? Does everybody feel like it's it's it will, we can leave it here? We'll try to do both. We'll try to get as much as we can on that day um, with a few different options. Do you have any clarification questions? No, that's fine. Okay. Perfect. Um, so on the topic of long-term care and the private long-term care association, um, I was asking too. Does anybody have any other associations they would like us to reach out to? to get their perspective on long-term care, whether it be private or, well, private. Uh, Trish? I think you mentioned the unions as well, uh, yeah. uh, workers and their experience. Yeah. Regarding the staffing issues at long-term care, correct? Yes. Is that? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So, um, so which unions would we want to see or? Uh, I think you've got UPSI, CUPE represents some of the private yeah. long-term care. Um, those are the two I know of off the top of my head, and yeah. I apologize if I'm forgetting anyone. Yeah. Perfect. Um, anything else? Can I just clarify? So for we had the unions regarding staffing issues, so I'll reach out to UPSC and CUPE. Um, we also wanted to speak to an association for private long-term care. So I have the PI Association for Community Long-Term Care. I did just want to check in that there were any others. I did speak to the executive director of that group, and he mentioned some other potential names like uh, Ram C. Duff, I believe, who had come in previously, PI Seniors Homes. So I just wanted to check if there were any other groups that the committee was interested in on that specific ask. Just one more I would suggest would be the nurses union because nurses are often work, they work in long-term care, so um, that would be an important voice as well to hear from. All right. Um, great. So at this time, uh, does anybody have any new business for the committee? Business? Can I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Zach Bell. Uh, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, members. <laughs>